Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, very excited with this topic, especially as a continuation of um, the last panel discussion, but in a very difficult um, condition, I would say, about what um, automation is today or artificial intelligence. Um, just very quickly, um, I'm Marissa Yu, an architect. I'm also running an NGO foundation here called Design Trust, um, just celebrating its 11th year in existence as a very small nonprofit organization, but very much invested into different ways of debate about culture and contemporary society through the lens of design. Um, so we're here um, in one sense to share a little bit about um, one of these huge topics uh, that Marina Otero in the middle um, is leading. She's the director of research and development from the new institute based in Rotterdam um, and also will be um, developing the next uh, big large Venice Biennale exhibition um, this May and June in Venice. Um, she's partnered with um, of Badir here, a co-researcher on this topic um, that is supported by the Design Trust Foundation um, and have been looking at very interesting critical case studies on the future of automation, what it means um, ethically, socially, programmatically, and especially its relationship to cities and Pearl River Delta. Um, and of course, uh, after their presentation, um, we'd like to invite uh, Dekai, who is also a professor and researcher based um, in Hong Kong at Hong Kong UST, uh, professor of uh, computer science and engineering, to respond along with an uh, architect and designer and um, lecturer at the University of Hong Kong, Roberto, who's had experience working um, at different companies and design studios in Shenzhen. So. As, as mentioned, uh, Eric Chen will be my tag team co-moderator, um, leading the M Plus um, Architecture Design Collection, which will be building and opening to the public 2020. So it's super exciting to have all of you here today at Art Basel discussing and sharing on um, the future of automation and what it looks like um, to have work without workers. So, Marina, would you like to share and kick off um, the presentation and ideas that you have? Um, yes, hello, and thank you for the introductions, Marisa. Uh, so, what we are going to show today is a research that we initiated at the New Institute, that is the Museum for Architecture, Design, and Digital Culture. Uh, on the, of the Netherlands. So as part of this institution, we have also the uh, archive, a state archive of uh, uh, architecture. Um, so generally, we look at architects, and we collect mostly architects. Um, but uh, we were questioning what in 50 years time, for instance, uh, we would like to see in the archive as representative of the type of architecture that is being created now. Um, so we thought that uh, it's not only buildings that are designed by architects or designers, but rather there is like, large infrastructures that are being popping up in the landscape and are extremely sophisticated architectures that nevertheless are not the ones that we generally see or experience. And these are what we call automated landscapes. Our factories that are mostly automated, our greenhouses, our ports, our all type of uh, infrastructures that that are being uh, transformed by technology. And um, with these transformations are also transformations connected to labor uh, markets, labor eth ethos and conditions, and also the design of cities uh, in general. So um, we did an architectural research uh, basically, has been a lot of talk about automation in the general media and uh, connected to economy. Um, but we wanted to analyze precisely how these spaces are designed. And most of the times, we don't put attention to that. Only when we see the patterns for uh, places like Amazon uh, and companies that uh, run these type of uh, spaces. But we thought we want to document and analyze very, in a very dry way uh, what are these architectures? But because in many cases, there are fundamental transformations of a space. There are many spaces that don't need natural light, or they don't need light at all. They are uh, completely uh, um, 
dark spaces, or that the dimensions are changing because the robots don't need exactly the same dimensions that a human being will uh, need to be in a comfortable space, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, we wanted to actually look what uh, happens today. We are not looking at those drawings that are floor plans, or architectural drawings, technical drawings, but rather uh, we are looking at it through the other perspective, more than an artistic perspective. So we commissioned this video, and Merve will explain more about it, to an artist, Li Chu Cheng, um, and she uh, went to some of these factories in the Pearl uh, River Delta and uh, analyzed through the eye of the artists, but also through mediated by technology, uh, how these spaces look like and what are the uh, spatial and uh, social transformations that are happening. The, the research that we are doing is a comparative research between the Netherlands, where the museum is uh, located, and uh, the area of the Pearl River Delta. In particular, we have been looking a lot of spaces in Shenzhen. And in the Netherlands, uh, what we see is a vast uh, landscape uh, that is completely populated by large uh, factories and greenhouses uh, that in most, most of the uh, times humans are not part of, of these spaces. And sometimes are extremely beautiful. They have aesthetic quality, uh, almost a sublime uh, image of uh, gardens of Eden that nevertheless we don't have access to. So the Westland is one of the areas in the Netherlands where all these uh, greenhouses are producing tomatoes, are producing different vegetables, are cultivating flowers that later are transported and circulated around the world. And mostly these spaces that are extremely beautiful as well uh, are not seen by any people. So they create certain large spaces that are enclosure spaces. And these type of uh, architectures are uh, happening more and more. So one of the case studies was these uh, greenhouses. The other is the port of Rotterdam that has been mostly automated. So workers that were generally driving the cranes and so on, they are not in the port anymore, but rather they are confined in an office building and they control this uh, infrastructure from the control room. So what were like port workers have been transformed into office uh, workers. And finally, we are also looking into other type of spaces that are, are um, connected to the idea of uh, automation as well and to the uh, Dutch design. So the, in the Netherlands, uh, is one of these spaces where these ideas of labor uh, have a particular um, design connected to sex work. And precisely sex work is one of the areas where automation is going to be also having a big impact. So in places like Amsterdam, in the red light district, there is a particular architecture, the uh, window brothels, uh, that is designed for uh, sex and uh, is, I don't know, it's a pity that we don't have the images here, but it's a very modern space, completely organized and designed according to modern standards, uh, with very regular tiles and lockers and looks nothing compared to anything uh, uh, sensual at all. And these spaces are being transformed into uh, spaces for creative professionals. And uh, it seems that in uh, some decades, the plan is that mm, these spaces will be also run by robot sex workers. So we are also analyzing uh, this type of sites of production in different scales and also with different type of uh, results. What we were interested in analyzing, but I think Merve will uh, explain it further, will be what are the ethical consequences of um, the appearance of these enclosed spaces that are larger and larger? What are the consequences also for the idea of the body, the human body and the worker? Uh, what type of uh, forms of segregation and contestation are these spaces uh, and these technologies bringing together. And uh, among everything as well, how to imagine that uh, um, a world uh, that is not completely utopian, because even we think that automation will allow us to have a different type of society, basically more uh, organized around leisure than around labor, there will be always bodies whatever we call them, like robots, artificial intelligence, or, but it's always the other will be doing this work. So across the research, we have been questioning as well, 
how we envision this uh, utopia in which nevertheless you are exploiting bodies, and I refer to bodies like machinic bodies, but also uh, more resourceful bodies, or uh, connected to sustainability and so on. So these infrastructures are creating particular spaces for uh, effective and uh, exploitation of resources in many different scales. So in a way, uh, as also the National Institute in the Netherlands, we are looking into creating policy and to understanding how this transformation, how these architectures could be regulated uh, or discussed in, in different scales. So I'm handing it to you, and uh, uh, Merve will explain a bit more about the video that uh, is, um, you are seeing, and also the research in the Pearl River Delta. Um, okay, so I take it from, uh, I take it a little um, uh, back and um, connect it from where uh, you were mentioning about the, uh, the matter of scales, let's say, the large scale interventions in the, in the Netherlands that were happening in the west, western part of the country. When we bring it to Pearl River Delta, actually the research um, uh, revealed in the first place that uh, it is indeed a matter of uh, economies of scale. So there are a lot of initiatives that are very small scale, very Shenzhen, you know, the, uh, the, uh, someone who was a tailor in, uh, who came to Shenzhen to be a tailor 20 years ago, uh, starts a fashion brand that is based on automation of the of his own work, actually, uh, as well as uh, the workers that are involved in the process. So we, on the one hand, we see this kind of uh, transformation of small-scale um, uh, work and initiative. And on the other hand, we see uh, giant interventions like uh, how BYD is uh, transforming its own uh, workforce, or likewise with Foxconn uh, or other factories that you see in Foshan or uh, Dongguan, etc. So it's not even so much about Shenzhen anymore. Um, uh, so we really try to address this kind of change of scales uh, within the research uh, and try to look at both sides of the story. So how does it happen uh, with the one person, one uh, initiative case and how does it also happen in the, in the larger scale? So one of the things, for instance, that we uh, realized uh, as a continuation of this kind of methodology was um, uh, the understanding is that automation is not necessarily the aim. So it's not uh, uh, particularly to um, transform the human with the worker, uh, with the robot. Uh, However, it could become the consequence based on the, the notion of economies of scale when you're producing a lot and when you're producing in repetitive uh, um, work, when you're producing within repetitive work, then you might actually uh, get to a full automated um, production. Uh, so this was one of the aspects. And the other aspect uh, that we realized uh, was actually the, uh, the imitation of the human behavior. So for instance, one of the the cases that we have looked at is a kitchen, is a robotic kitchen, uh, which is which actually uh, uh, designs a process that is the imitation of the robot uh, of the human chef that creates a system that is then uh, um, automating the the hand and the arm movements of the chef. Um, this not only means that you are automating the process of cooking itself, but you are also basically eliminating the kitchen from the house, from the dwelling. So this also means that you are creating a different typology. And what we see, what we saw in Shenzhen, for instance, that there are already several new developments that, uh, of housing without kitchens, basically. Uh, so we are also talking about a change of uh, environment, There's a change of spatial conditions, a change of um, um, a, an implication of automation in the in the architectural space. Um, we, in relation to, let's say, an exploitation of human body, what we also see, uh, what we also saw in the case of the tailor, for instance, that uh, with the body scanning machine that the tailor, uh, Mr. He, developed, uh, the physical body is translated to a virtual one. And with the online platform that he has developed, uh, basically the, the, the most uh, fitting, uh, the best uh, pattern that 
is perfect for your body can be developed on the online platform. So it's actually then uh, a, a, a moment or a transition to an ideology of AI, which we can come back to it during the discussion. So this way you are actually getting rid of the brain force or the intellectual uh, force of the tailor himself, but you are actually giving it to the to the platform, to the to the software, to the AI, which can then generate several patterns, uh, several um, models uh, uh, for a certain outfit, which is suitable for the for the human. Uh, what we also see with with this ki kind of transition, actually, the online platform or the tailor actually becomes. Uh, a database of virtual bodies. So this is also interesting. And you are, as the customer, you're giving away uh, the information about your body. Um, another case we looked at was uh, uh, agriculture drone or drone agriculture, which makes highlands available for cultivation. So this is another level of implication on the architectural space or built environment, uh, where you see more land becoming available for human intervention and uh, further than could have uh, futures that you uh, could from now speculate, but also you don't really know what might happen. Um, maybe I just mention a little bit about the factories and then I can finish it with that. Um, so uh, moving on from these kinds of singular uh, interventions like the tailor or the kitchen towards the factories themselves, uh, what we see in a couple of cases like Ashcloud, which is a factory that produces cell phone accessories, um, a, a kind of understanding of accelerating the automation of the human workers. So they don't necessarily, they wouldn't necessarily want to automate uh, the work for the human labor completely, but they would, uh, they would rather keep the human labor uh, precisely because of uh, their level of flexibility and their ability to, uh, to uh, make pre precise uh, production processes happen. Um, they, uh, they would rather introduce this kind of uh, this uh, AI, this application that they have developed, which will manage the whole process in the factory. So th this also means um, managing the resources, managing the outcomes, managing the waste, managing the profit, but also managing the, the human labor. Uh, what we then see is actually an acceleration of the automation of the human rather than uh, using robots instead of human workers. Um, maybe I just finish with the last uh, case, which is uh, the large uh, factory BYD, which produces batteries. Uh, I think it's like the f fifth biggest factory in the world that produces batteries. In that case, we actually see almost a complete automation of the process. Uh, when we went to the factory, maybe we, we saw maybe three people in total who were there only to control what was going on, to make sure that the uh, production process was efficient and precise enough. Um, and that's what brings me back to the beginning of the story where um, Automation is, again, not necessarily the aim, but it does become the consequence when you're producing in such scale. Great, thank you, uh, Marina and, uh, and, 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 and Merva. Um, no, the, this, this, the, the actual spatial, or the, the implications on the built environment is something that we, we definitely want to uh, come back to, because uh, that, that is the sort of crux of your research. Um, but maybe I, I thought I'd start with sort of um, uh, with sort of an observation, maybe, because uh, uh, what, what's so sort of fascinating to, to me about our, our current moment uh, is that you know, all these things like automation, AI, you know, smart cities, smart homes, all these sorts of things that, 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 that keep um, uh, populating our, our, um, our, 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 our discourse, the, at, at their root, these are all ideas that were imagined uh, in the 20th century, and in some cases even earlier. Uh, so in many ways, our, our present seems to be focused on realizing the future of the past and dealing with its actual implications. And that's sort of what you're, you're, you're doing with your research. Um, in terms of uh, this sort of comparative study that you're doing uh, between the Netherlands and the, and the Pearl River Delta, um, you know, when, when we think about the real-world implications of, 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 of these uh, 
emergent uh, uh, the technologies, uh, we, we have to then sort of also uh, bring culture uh, into the equation because I think it's becoming increasingly clear uh, that these different cultural perspectives have different relationships with these kinds of technologies. I mean, um, when, when I was in London, uh, I, I was in London last year when it, uh, there was a BBC program on, on Japan and designing technology and, and all the Londoners were, were sort of shocked um, by how um, uh, how comfortable the Japanese were with 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 uh, companion robots. I mean, to them, it seemed like such an abnegation of responsibility to, especially for the elderly, to develop robots instead of have human uh, caretakers for the elderly. Uh, whereas when the, uh, the show interviewed the actual el el elderly, they they preferred robots because, you know, there are some embarrassing moments uh, when you're uh, older, and 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 they felt more comfortable not having an uh, another human uh, sort of see them go through some of the changes there they're going through. Uh, even more recently, uh, one of the heads of uh, one of the big Chinese tech companies, I forget which one, um, uh, made a bit of a, uh, a stir when he basically said outright something that I think we all, most of us know, which is that the Chinese uh, have a different relationship with privacy than Westerners might, you know, and and uh, um, and, and there's not as, as much of, of resistance or fear of having their information, you know, being being, being used by, by whomever. In your research, um, uh, what are the sort of uh, different cultural uh, takes on automation that, that, that you may have observed? Yeah, so um, no, I think to, to your first point, that this idea that it seems that we are now realizing um, dreams that were maybe from the 60s or 70s, that's, that's true. So in our research, we are looking at the work of the artist Constant, mm -hmm. and in particular, New Babylon, and was this uh, endless city and society that was organized around leisure in terms, instead of uh, labor. And it was facilitated by automation. Um, so it was a nomadic society, always based on play, where humans will uh, construct their own environments. And uh, what it started to be like a very utopian um, image of, of the future, as the work of Constant evolved, um, he started to do paintings. He was working with models, but he started to do paintings in which he was depicting more violent relations. So as the project uh, evolves, certain uh, kind of... Uh, bodies started to appear and populate this infrastructure and suddenly the bodies are started to be stains of uh, blood. So he realized that uh, when you have a new technological order, uh, even if it's for the good, having a society that doesn't have to work and so on, it always brings contestation, it always brings violence. And what it is more important, even um, when uh, society is liberated from work and labor. That doesn't mean that uh, violence is not, the core, uh, is not at the core of what society is and the social relations are applicated. So what is interesting is that this idea of, of Constant were developed from the 50s, end of 50s to the 70s. And uh, now uh, this type of uh, projects are being implemented uh, by real uh, in places like uh, Rotterdam or, or, or here. And it's true that there is a cultural difference that we have uh, found, whereas in the Netherlands, uh, first of all, um, there is more um, reticence to allow people to enter in those spaces. So only for the sake of the research, we wouldn't, uh, weren't able to enter, in, for instance, in the port of Rotterdam that has been uh, completely automated. It's very secretive in a sense. Like, uh, there, is, uh, there is a tour that allows you to be near it, but there is always uh, these enclosures are always very uh, distant from the society. The same happened with these uh, spaces of the greenhouses. The same happens with... So it was, uh, on the one hand, it happens because it's also quite polemic. Because the uh, uh, way in which it is read is that uh, humans are being replaced by robots, and that will create unemployment, that will create different uh, social disruptions, and actually happens because the workers of the port have been replaced. The number of jobs keeps being the same, but uh, the job has changed. Um, so I think that's the perception, whereas I think in, the, in what we found in the Pearl River Delta is a completely different understanding of the relation between humans and machines. That is not one, one or the other, 
but rather it's a more symbiotic uh, relation. But maybe you can uh, explain a little bit more about it. Um, no, exactly. That's what I was going to say. It's the, it's a matter of coexistence um, or doing it together, managing it together, uh, bringing it what the human can offer and the robot can offer uh, together in the same space. Um, so that's at least um, in terms of our observations, doing the research uh, here in Pearl River Delta uh, from the workers' point of view or from the people's point of view, um, the, uh, the idea is not necessarily a about um, separating the work environment or uh, living in different places uh, in the future uh, uh, city. If we are going to live with robots, we live in the same space. Um, we share the same space. We work together. We, um, yeah. So it's uh, so this kind of understanding understanding of life, um, understanding of daily life is is very is uh, also in the workplace. Uh, Takai, what do you think? I mean, in, in the 1930s, there's uh, John Maynard Keynes famously predicted that technology and automation uh, would make life so wonderful that the greatest challenge for society uh, would be managing the abundance of, of leisure time uh, and, 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 and resources. Um, whereas now you have people like Elon Musk telling us that um, you know, robots are going to be the spell the doom of, of, of humankind. I mean, what, as someone who, sp who spends a lot of time thinking about these things, where do you stand? Yeah, so um, Elon uh, is working together with a friend of mine who's another professor at Berkeley, um, uh, Stuart Russell. Uh, you know, I think that's the... Uh, it, I agree. I mean, we all, thousands of us in AI signed on the petitions against killer drones. But that is really kind of still the this, this Hollywood sci-fi tip of the iceberg. Yeah, that's a worry. But we have, I think, a lot of other worries that are far closer. We, we're living in an era where, um, those of you who were in the previous session, you know, I mentioned Cambridge Analytica has um, already sucked up the private data of almost probably everybody in the room here, because most people are on Facebook, um, and, and then used that to completely change um, our perception of, of reality. Um, and that is something that I see as just just an example of what is happening today with the convergence of technology in in virtual reality and AI and so forth because um, you know the whole our whole sense of what reality is 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 heavily heavily based on what space is perceived to be uh, and uh, heavily on where we are relative to our spaces um, this notion that somehow we think abstractly is is not really true. We, we think in terms of our bodies. We, we think very much in terms of where things are relative to us. Um, and so uh, other than things that are very basic, such as, you know, I'm, I'm cold or I'm hungry, everything else that you think is typically in terms of a metaphor that is couched in, ter uh, for example, um, the day before yesterday in Chinese, right? Qian Tian is, is like in front of you, but like uh, in other languages, like English is behind you, right? And uh, why is temperature being uh, um, high, meaning that it's hot? Why is that not cold? Um, this permeates uh, the way that we conceptualize space. And so when I see examples like of what we're talking about that are still um, looking at, in this age of automation, um, how is space being used? I can't help but also be thinking at the same time that our very no perceptions of space are being altered. Um, that uh, today we already live in an era where I can, I literally, I can be cooped up in a tiny little cube, whether it's on the airplane where I spend way too much time, or in you know some tiny, tiny little corner, and I can entertain myself for hours. I can be there happily because I have this, and this is uh, my virtual reality already, right? I mean, I would bet that 90% of you are, would be lying to say that you can't just fall into this virtual reality, stay there for hours, um, and can you even, like, these things are only 10 years old, right? And, and all these social networks are even younger. Can you even imagine being able to do that 15 years ago 
if somebody put you into a tiny little box and said you have to sit there for 15 hours, you would go crazy. Right? And so I, I feel that a lot of these things, and, and it's a pity that Merva's images weren't there, um, and also Marina's, like where you have really, really tiny spaces, it's sort of, that doesn't matter anymore because we're now living in an age where our perception of reality is, is not just the physical space, but it's also increasingly our virtual space. And the virtual space is increasingly populated by agents who are not only our, our human community scattered all over the world, but also these artificial communities. All, um, in, and, you know, like I was giving this example last night where, you know, I live far away. I live in Cycle. So um, I often have to drive home late at night from Central. Um, and so it's like, you know, I'm driving for an hour and it's been great. But now an hour drive at 2 a.m., nobody around you, what do you do? Okay, you could listen to music. I do that. But you can also leave your Google Maps on and the voice can be t telling you, take the exit over there. And you feel like, oh, there's human contact. I, you know, someone else is still awake with me. Right? And all of these things, I think, are you know, changing what's, what's happening. And, and same thing with labor. You know, what's, what is this perception of labor? Same thing with ethics. Is there really such a thing as in the previous session, somebody mentioned the idea that there's a universal ethics. Is there really such a thing as a universal ethics? Is there really such a thing as a universal perception of labor? Um, I think most of us would agree that monotony is labor. But we're, we're living in an age of automation where most of that monotonous work is, is very rapidly being taken over by automation, by what, we, what I call mindless AI. Right? And what that leaves for us is that leaves for us, the kind of labor which is not mindless, which is more creative, which is more interesting. And what's work to you is play for me, is art for me, is creativity for me. Right? So is there such a universal? So these are the questions that I'm, yeah. Yeah, and Sorry. I was also thinking the reality of the, you know, the condition that we live in Hong Kong, um, to contextualize it. Um, so if, say, for example, um, housing crises or the housing market um, at present, uh, approximate 11 to 12 square meters is the average normative right, condition of an apartment. And having these conceptual references to, um, say, compared to New York, which uh, microhousing is around 28 square meters. Um, so there's a discussion on relativity and um, the reality, but at the same time, the agency of how these topics, um, I believe, can shape and change instead of, as you said, accepting um, the future that is beyond us. So I'm just maybe opening it up to um, Roberto also, because you've been working as an architect um, also in Shenzhen. There's a lot of possibilities of experimentation of um, technology <clears throat> and also this, this notion of that, um, you know, in the benefit of where reality or not reality is lying, there's a real discussion of um, values and um, who does or what and who benefits right from this discussion of automation. Um, of course, we know from some of the earlier discussions last night on the last few weeks, um, China has invested in this uh, Guangdong province uh, policy on 2015 onwards. We will be investing and supporting small businesses or big manufacturers um, to focus on fully automated landscapes. So just curious from an architecture standpoint, um, less cultural, what does it mean for our cities? And um, any thoughts on that? And then maybe we can bring it back to what Dakai was provoking us to think about in terms of <laughs> ethics and ownership. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to answer your, fir your first question, with, which uh, has to do with who benefits, um, I think uh, in the ar architecture industry, I think changes very slowly. Um, so you could argue that some aspects of it uh, are being influenced by AI or by computation. They're typically delegated to very specific tasks. I mean, they do have a very strong influence, but um, I, I would sort of second Dakai's, uh, I guess, optimistic vision in the sense that more of the fun stuff remains available to us. Uh, we can sort of automate the articulation of a facade with a script. We can sometimes automate uh, 
the planning uh, of a building based on a sort of efficient objectives. But at the end of the day, you know, an architect beyond pre being a problem solver is also trying to create a vision. And I think that aspect of creativity is the one that benefits in a way because you have more time to make those decisions and establish those uh, design intents. Uh, but I think, I mean, architecture is probably in a privileged position in that regard because change happens very slowly. If anything, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm not optimistic, but I, I have questions uh, as to the speed, in a way, through which some of these changes happen and, and the impact of that in other industries. Um, I'll share a, briefly uh, a story. Uh, a few years ago, I was working on a competition in Singapore. In the office, we got a drone and we, we wanted to survey the site and whatnot. And it happened at the point in time when there was no regulation for the use of drones in Singapore. And during the duration of that competition, that regulation actually changed. So the first trip, we were able to freely use it. And a few weeks later, we actually completely were not able to. And interestingly enough, during that first trip, the drone actually crashed against a tree and sort of fell because uh, we were surveying a landscape. Uh, and well, you could say that was potentially dangerous, and maybe that's part of the reason the regulation happened. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make is, is how optimistic can we be if these regulations are unable to catch up with the advancement in technology? I mean, I think for me, that's a kind of very interesting question that I would like to open up to the rest of you. How optimistic can we be, and how fast can we be at controlling aspects of it that could be very dangerous, potentially. Um, I'd like to respond to that. From, from, the, um, from the case of Eshcloud, which basically uh, manages the factory with the use of the application, uh, in which case the design of the floor plan is a facilitator of the app also. So there's no, so the architecture is merely the, the, the shell and the structure of the building. And everything else, the workflow continuously changes and the architecture space changes continuously, which is dictated by the use of the app, um, the sort of AI that manages the, the factory. Um, to the point where the higher level managers basically make a decision about controlling the app itself. So we were talking about this, um, what this would mean, let's say, um, why not we just let go the app and it actually just manages the factory? Why don't we allow it to make the decisions which are, okay, maybe about optimizing, but because it is going to be learning from itself, maybe it will start making other decisions about the productivity of the factory, about the labor, uh, managing the labor and everything else. And then we actually said, um, but we will never allow this to happen. In the end, we will never allow this uh, to happen, the, the AI to take over com uh, completely the management of the factory. And what happens is the AI will go crazy, basically, right? Like, I don't know what the guy would say about this, but uh, the AI would need some therapy, no? I mean, <laughs> and this would be, again, something to bring back for the, uh, the human being, the therapist in the process. I'm exaggerating the story a bit. I mean, just to... to um, to, to provoke the discussion further, but yeah. Just, just briefly, uh, adding to what, what Merve was saying, um, in some of these factories, what is interesting is exactly is just a shell. And uh, what before were partitions, so a particular spatial design, now has become lines in the floor and QR codes that are read by the machines. So the machines never, like, the architecture becomes very diagrammatic and also even quite banal in some cases, uh, because the way of like seeing the gaze of the machine sometimes is not the same gaze as the human, and the conditions are different. Um, so I will say that what is interesting is, OK, if automation will bring more space for creativity, Let's work more on that, because uh, when we are actually uh, have the possibility to, to imagine other worlds, uh, we came up replicating the, uh, replicating the worlds in which we live it. That is happening with Mars. It's this idea that we can colonize a planet and we can create another society. What we see in all the designs is re basically is replicating conditions that are happening on Earth. And basically there are several Mars now happening on Earth in different deserts and places where there are simulations, uh, missions 
uh, uh, simulations being in Mars. So this kind of uh, idea of utopia or new realities uh, afforded by uh, technology or, or in this case automation, uh, I will claim that we need more creativity and imagination in order to, to develop other, other stories and not replicate the conditions that are uh, being uh, used now. So these ideas of exploitation, so these ideas uh, of exploitation of, of, of resources or bodies and, and so on, what will be another type of paradigm. And what is uh, beautiful as well is in places like virtual realities, like Second Life, for instance, users uh, that have the capacity to design basically under completely different conditions. So you don't have to design a building with windows, or you don't have to design a door, you don't have to design a fence. Nevertheless, most of the architectures that populate virtual spaces have also uh, elements that are needed only in the will say physical world. So even when we have the chance to go completely crazy and be more creative, we end up replicating models to which we are used, uh, to our bodies are used to. So I thought it was a paradox that is worth uh, exploring. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think that crosses a little bit into the science fiction. I mean, you know, in shows like Star Trek or Star Wars or things like that. Um, obviously, uh, the setting is very different, the conditions are very different, potentially there's lack of gravity or whatnot, but there's always this sort of underlying argument that in order for us to find comfort, you know, we replicate what we know. Um, uh, and I mean, I think that goes back to this, what you mentioned earlier about culture and how with different cultures we basically have different approaches and different solutions. Uh, in, in that sense, things become very ambiguous. You know? it's, it's not, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and it can even cross into a philosophical realm, which becomes kind of really difficult to pin down and assess. I mean, and it's interesting that a conversation that is essentially about machines and technology goes so quickly into something that is so ambiguous. So, I mean, the thing about this is that our perception of what, what, what the actual space is, what the actual reality is, what the actual ethics is, is completely conditioned on our, cult, our own cultural background, our, our own, what, what's familiar to us in our culture. And while, you know, like at some level, that seems obvious to everybody, but I think what is maybe not so obvious is how deep that goes. It goes really, really deep. So that same tiny little space, windowless and all that kind of stuff, becomes this magical thing if I have augmented reality glasses and, and a connection, right? And, and suddenly I have this immense space in my perception, which is totally contextual, right? And is like what, what I was calling yesterday, you know, my, it's like virtual suburbia. So you might be in this tiny little micro space, but like um, you actually feel like you have a huge amount of space. And, and the same thing goes for ethics, the same thing goes for labor, and it, it's all the way down to the most primitive levels. So um, let me give you an example sort of more from the cognitive science side at how deep this goes. I, I, I brought along a little prop just in case. Um, to, so, so like if you, if you just listen to, like if I, if I um, you know, use this thing and beat uh, something in a very, very simple musical language to you, um, I just wanna like, like ask you how do you feel this, like, if I'm doing something like this, what do you hear? Come on, guys. The march, the this march is of the, the easy robots. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, seeing some of you, like, a bunch of you are kind of going boom, cha, cha, boom, like, like a waltz or something. But it isn't what I played, right? Anybody notice what I actually played? What I played was actually cha, cha, boom, cha, cha, boom, one, two, three, right? But you took that to mean something else, most of you. I don't know, maybe you didn't. In, in, because I just in, wanted to move, I don't know. There, there are some, I don't know what I was There are a lot of cultures um, outside of the ones that we're probably from, most of us, where it's the natural feeling would be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Right, like such as flamenco, right? And so if you have something like that, and then now you have a more complex environment, right? Because that's pretty much the simplest musical sentence that I could possibly have given you other than 
which maybe some of you like, but it's a little bit boring, right? Um, <laughs> And, and then, so, like, but then you think about the environments that we normally live in. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm using, like, auditory examples because I'm a musician, so, like, it's easier than, but like, you could imagine doing the same thing with optical illusions, um, with fictions, and uh, with things like that, right? But if you, if you take something which is, like, a more complex uh, language that would be similar to the sorts of visual language that, that you're seeing in this, and you ask, how would you interpret that? Um, so, for example, if I do something like this. Show me with your hands, like just sort of show me with your hands where where the beat is. Maybe you can. where the beat is. Yeah. Okay, apparently not. So, so the thing is, that was actually a regular pattern in a in a regular beat that would, you know, pe somebody from um, a southern Spanish um, cultural background would have no problems in detecting, right? And so, for any of these things that we're talking about with with labor, with ethics, with space, you're bringing all of that into it, and there's a tendency for us to try to say, look, look for. Um, objectification, uh, you know, something objective, right? The, the previous session, the speaker talking about universal ethics, right? And, I, and there were hints of that also in the discussions of space and labor that were sort of coming out. And I think what I'm trying to point out from a cognitive science point is that th this doesn't really exist. It's all in our minds. So uh, speaking of audience participation, we should probably uh, open this up uh, to questions from the audience. So if, um, if, 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 if anyone has any uh, burning questions, or keep thinking it out, oh, good. Uh. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Or just give us one. Thanks. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Sheridan. Probably a question um, for you. Um, I'm fascinated that the Netherlands was kind of, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> has led the conversation around new ways of working and activity-based working, and now leading a conversation about what does space look like when work is automated. What do you think culturally about the Netherlands has you guys be the thought leader um, in this space? How do you think about the Netherlands thing? In general, no, no, as, as a culture, being so. underwater a lot. That, yeah, uh, <laughs> allows. So, no, I think it's good. She, uh, she's yeah, just, like, what, what about the Netherlands? Has this be a focus for you guys culturally as a country? Um, for, because you really are the thought leaders about the future of work and how people interact at work. Yeah, well, I mean, there are certain conditions in the Netherlands that we always claim that is a testing uh, field for the future of work has been always a place that is a testing ground for these conditions. And it's precisely because the artificiality, well, two conditions I will claim, if I may, uh, the artificiality of the landscape that is mostly man-made. So basically everything is somehow possible, or that's the uh, understanding that you have about the landscape. It's everything could be possible, everything can be done. So it's one of the places, like, it's the producer of um, um, most of the agricultural products in the world. It's a tiny country to be uh, such a, a place. And on the other is the culture, like Calvinist culture, that um, focuses primarily on labor and work, is praising the work rather than leisure. And obviously now the contemporary culture is much more mixed and is uh, uh, tinted with many other uh, conditions, but still I think these two questions remain. So it's always reinventing what it means to inhabit 
uh, earth because uh, Dutch culture is always about protecting uh, the land from the sea and the technology somehow you could imagine that the land is completely automated in the way that it's always regulated to keep the water level at certain levels. So there's already this idea of technology, the body, and the landscape is always interacting. So for us, it's a fascinating uh, space to imagine uh, what could be the future, but also analyzing what are the conditions that are being created already. Any other questions? Could I ma maybe add to that? Yeah, I mean, be, um, living in the Netherlands before uh, for 10 years, but also in other countries in, the, in Europe, what I could say is one thing that you for sure observe is the, that human is the center of the earth. Everything is for the human. Um, whatever is happening around you is to serve you. This, like, it's my personal opinion, but this is how I, oh, uh, this is how I think the culture around it, it also develops. So the automation of the of large parts of the country, <clears throat> as long as it serves you, um, you could live with it, I guess. Again, I'm, uh, it's uh, I'm putting it forward as a provocation. Um, but for for uh, as long as I have been here, uh, which is a little around, let's say two two years in total, going back and forth, it's very much about an understanding of, um, uh, let's say, not human centered so much, uh, that everything c kind of benefits each other. And is that about to change with AI? No, I think it was always there, actually. I mean, I've, I've, I'm originally from Turkey, so I can also bring that from, uh, to, to the perspective. Like, we have a phrase literally saying that um, the water, the tree, the, the human, and the sky, we are all part of the same story. I, I don't want to get into Donna Haraway, but it's a bit like, you know, I, I think that is the kind of transition from one part of the world to the other, where we can actually see a future culturally, and uh, that is more about um, living together for better or for worse. Well, can, oh, so, well I mean, this, this, uh, this came up a couple of times um, uh, uh, where, where we refer to us, right? Uh, AI and automation is going to be great for us because we can be free, the John Maynard kids, uh, we, we can be free to pursue much more fun, uh, creative things. But I, I'd like to ask, Maybe especially Dakai and, and Roberto, since you you both use that um, that 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 term, uh, who, who is them and what about them? Uh, or or should we be happy just to sort of keep them in the little boxes with VR goggles, <laughs> so they so, feel like they're not in little boxes? So Eric, I, I think you know that I have this whole other message that us includes the AIs that that in fact we are like, you know, all already, the, these things, all of you already have children because these things are your artificial kids. They're, I mean, you're raising them. You, you don't realize this, but um, they're, they're watching everything you do just like any human kid. They're learning from what you do, from what you read, from what you hit like on, from what you laugh at, from what you share, from your e the email is coming in. And then they're taking all those values and they're taking all of these um, attitudes that they're picking up from you and they're re reflecting them back into human society, except that now it's a human and machine society. Um, and in fact, they're more integral and influential and active uh, and imitative and learning than most human members of society are. And without realizing it, we've already become a society which is not made merely of us, quote, humans, it's us humans and machines. And this is only the very beginning of AI. I mean, our AIs are, are very weak today. They don't do even what a three-year-old can do. They make mistakes that a three-year-old would laugh at. Um, and yet, they already drive so much of our culture. They already decide what memes to spread, what attitudes to reward, what ideas to share. And so that is the new context in which not only we are developing our perceptions, but also, that is the new context under which each successive new generation of stronger AIs is learning culture, using that to frame what they think they should do, and spreading that right back into society in a hyper-accelerated cultural evolution. 
But society today looks nothing like what it did 10 years ago. Fast forward 25 years, have you any idea what culture is going to look like? No, I got, suddenly I was just reminded we're in the context of Art Basel. And with this beautiful uh, automated film um, by the artist and by New Institute, and what you were saying gave me a very horrific reminder that we're contextually inside a convention center um, with an amazing art market, an unbelievable kind of cultural context in um, Hong Kong and China right now. And I'm just wondering about these notions of ownership or scripts or data banking, big data, that begins to transform our values and how we also see um, and project. So for example, if someone gives me an identity that I need to purchase or collect this particular art piece because of its value, or um, could I pr propose um, better public spaces and um, begin to advocate as an agency to the government that this is the perfect statistical methodology um, to produce the perfect city that actually works? Do you think this is the optimistic future uh, where we do to learn and listen? Um, and how do we create that feedback loop that actually could be benefiting, um, not so much like universally, but for certain communities that are actually extremely underprivileged? Because we are in a very privileged uh, context right now when we talk about this. And, and I'm just really curious what that would look like. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is the time to begin a conversation no, about micropayments and blockchain. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I know we have 30 seconds, but I just... Actually, we're 30 seconds over. Over. So, so. <laughs> but I'm just really curious, like, just being in Art Basel in this conversation series within the art market and the cultural market that is so vibrant, what would you say to this context question? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. So I won't answer your question. <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to answer a, a simpler question, which was the us versus them question. And I mean, for me, I, I, would, I, would, I would say that it's a matter of intelligence, maybe, if that can be somehow evaluated. And that potentially now it is still us versus them. And then at some point, if we become equally as intelligent, then it will become we, but if one of the two, and say the machine becomes more, then it can become again us and them. Or, or, or if we become dumber as we are doing. Or, yeah, <laughs> or that. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's something that is in flux somehow, and we're in a transitional moment. But I, I cannot immediately say, uh, be optimistic about, about it, or, or apocalyptic about it either. I just have no idea where it's where it's going to go. But it, it, it's, it's likely to be integrated and, and blurry and diverse rather than A, B, C. And maybe on that note, uh, uh, whether that note is an optimistic or a pessimistic note uh, is, is, is up for all of you to decide on your own. Uh, of course, we don't know what the future will bring, but we know it will be different somehow. Um, we have to thank uh, Art Basel uh, for, for, for hosting us here and, of course, Des uh, Design Trust for making this, this project uh, possible. Uh, thanks to all four speakers, uh, Roberto, Marina, uh, Merva, and, and, um, and uh, Kai, Dekai, excuse me. Uh, and, of course, most of all, thanks to all of you for coming. And I think there's another talk here in about uh, two and a half minutes. So uh, if you want to stick around for that, please do. Thank you. Thank you.